welcome on Primetime Watchmaking in the News and February is always a transition month between what brands revealed at the SIHH and what the other brands will reveal in a few days at Baselworld. So a bit less product announcements uh, during February but uh, nevertheless some very interesting stories coming your way. But first, just wanted to share how happy I am having reached a pretty sweet milestone for us with 75,000 subscribers on YouTube, starting to become a pretty big family out there. So that's mighty cool. And next big one will be 100K. And must admit that if this was going to occur by the end of 2018, well, that would make me immensely happy again. Who knows? Could happen. You know, my optimistic uh, spirit. I also wanted to thank you very, very much uh, for the nice feedback received regarding both our Who's Who of Watchmaking video dedicated to Patek Philippe and the second episode of uh, the new Don't Do This at Home series uh, with the deconstruction of the Rolex Submariner. I was very happy to uh, hear and read uh, your understanding in making for the, for the time being the full version available only to our patrons because as mentioned our patrons are special and they deserve special treatment. And it's thanks to them that we'll continue to improve the coverage of uh, the watchmaking planet. So uh, I confirm that we will publish the second part of this video uh, in a few weeks time and if you can't wait well you simply know what to do and you can become a patron link below and just to give you a little heads up uh, uh, our next who's who of watchmaking will concern another very illustrious name in watchmaking Breguet we'll come back on its uh, rich history and the many incredible technical contributions made by the famous watchmaker to the art of timekeeping but after this next uh, episode uh, we'll directly ask you who you want us to cover or to be more precise uh, this will be another little advantage granted to our patrons since we will submit uh, the poll to them and and they will choose for us between three proposed brands. So for the uh, time being, I'm considering Olmar Piguet, Vacheron Constantin, Panerai, Breitling, MBNF, Richard Mille. Any ideas? And since I just mentioned Breitling, well, that uh, was one of the rare brands to come up with some pretty serious announcements in the past few weeks. Not only did they introduce their new Navitimer 8 collection, but they also shared a bit more uh, regarding where the brand is heading. So this new collection will most probably be the first of many novelties introduced uh, by them in the months to come. And we can totally trust its new kind of high profile management team uh, to do what it takes to occupy the media scene and challenge the top spots in the watchmaking arena. You have to remember that at the helm of all this, you now have George Kern. Uh, that's the rather talented marketer behind the spectacular commercial development of IWC. But you know my feelings about some of IWC's products. And when I see these new Brightlings, uh, well, I seriously don't really know what to think about them so far. Seems a bit banal when you consider the brand's uh, iconic status. But I've only seen a few pictures and I have to be uh, honest and have to wait until Basel World to express a more thorough appreciation on the matter. Anyhow, they introduced uh, five watches in this new uh, Navitimer 8 collection, starting with the chrono version coming in a 43mm steel or red gold case, that's the B01, uh, which holds their in-house chrono movement. It will be recognizable with the panda-like counters, meaning with a two-tone dial, one for the dial itself and the other one for the chrono sub-dials. It has a sapphire case back and this watch will be priced uh, slightly above the 7,000 US dollar mark. You have another chrono, simply called the Navitimer 8 chronograph and also comes in a 43 3 millimeter case but no gold version and for this one just uh, I mean it's just steel and it holds a Valjoux 7750 movement and will therefore be priced more aggressively and in terms of design differentiation with the previous model I mean the dial is unitone and there's no sapphire case back no movement to be seen then you have a well timer called the Unitime also 43 millimeter steel case with two dial versions a day date version also 43 millimeter and finally a simple three hand version just called the Navitimer 8 automatic but this one coming in a 41 millimeter steel case. And what comes out of this uh, first launch of the new Breitling is that they definitely want to lower the price entry point into the brand. We'll do some follow-up on this because I'm pretty convinced that we're going to see a lot of Breitling in the near future. This is a serious brand with uh, strong industrial capabilities, in-house movements and so forth. It has a rich past and we can already see these uh, vintage inspired watches coming. Uh, that's obviously going to happen but it's nevertheless going to be quite interesting to see and witness how they will develop uh, the brand which most certainly has a lot of uh, commercial potential I mean beyond the legitimate positioning and association with the world of aviation I mean for instance and to mark this and maybe you've noticed but they've already dropped the wings on their logo and uh, came back to a more historic version of the logo emphasizing the, the, the B of uh, Breitling. 
So something I just wanted to add uh, regarding this uh, kind of relaunch of the brand is that they definitely want to take us by surprise. I mean, for instance, we can be pretty sure that previously any serious new product uh, launch such as this one uh, would have been done at uh, Basel World. But this time, this was actually firstly announced during some kind of world tour starting in China, then in Europe and finally in the US. And China represents a huge development opportunity for Breitling. The brand is almost uh, absent there. Most of their watches are simply too big uh, for that market and chronos are not something uh, to appreciate there uh, either. So going back to, to making smaller models makes sense and uh, demonstrating some other facets of the brand also makes sense, especially when you consider that uh, their Super Ocean model is in fact today's most uh, successful watch uh, for the brand. So I guess that uh, these kind of uh, cheesy movies with aviators trying to impress pin-up girls is something of the past and you didn't really have to be a marketing genius to come up with uh, this conclusion. Well, again, time will tell and looking forward to seeing uh, these watches in real soon. Still really like my old uh, Breitling better, I think, uh, which actually has a little nice little micro rotor inside. Quite neat. Okay, let's now talk about uh, Basel World because this is just around the corner and this year we are going to take our coverage, I mean really to the next level. For the first time we'll actually be inside the world's most uh, important watch fair. Uh, we'll have our very own booth and this will help us produce more and better. So for all of you coming to Basel World, please don't hesitate uh, to drop by. We'll be in Hall 1 on the second floor just next to the atelier. That's the section uh, dedicated to the independent brands and I have to admit that I'm pretty excited about this prospect. I know that uh, the event is in some kind of turmoil. I've talked about it quite extensively already. There are much uh, fewer brands exhibiting, though it concerns mainly the jewelry side of the event. And this edition is, pretty, uh, is a pretty pivotal one for the organizer. There's a lot at stake and the reason of being of such event is seriously getting more and more questionable. It's not that they are not needed, it's just that their mission has changed and must change and this is something that the organizer had to take into account and adapt, and adapt their model. It's not business as usual. The rationale has changed and the costs involved for the brands attending uh, are kind of another time and have simply become harder and harder to justify. I mean, brands don't use uh, such a platform to launch all their no yearly novelties at once. Retailers don't do their yearly shopping either. Journalists have less means to attend. Public, I mean, it's also a bit costly to go there. But at the same time, I really think that it's super important to maintain or better to develop the link between the end consumer, you guys that are making this industry work, and the brands and the people behind them. I mean the creators, the watchmaker, etc. So that's why I think such events should be more geared towards the idea of experience and sharing and propose a different environment. And during the last SIHH I quickly asked uh, Laurent Dordet, the CEO of Hermes, uh, why they dropped Basel to join the Geneva event. Yes, SIHH for sure is a very homogeneous place. We share a lot of values with uh, all those brands. We are in a more uh, um, exclusive uh, fair today and, and, and that's one of the reasons. The second reason we are here is probably the open-mindedness of this fair. It's open to the public on Friday, it's open to new talentous uh, young uh, or, uh, or older uh, watchmaker, Carré des Horlogers. Uh, and for us to be open-minded and to try and to dare new things is very important. So uh, SIHH open-mindedness is one of the reasons we are here. So yes, it is for sure a challenging moment for Basel and rapidly coming to Breitling. George Kern, the brand's CEO, has openly admitted that he is seriously considering pulling out uh, too and this will probably happen. And that would be the first major brand, uh, again beyond Hermès, uh, but it could most certainly be followed by some other big players. In fact, I think it just needs a couple of these big, big names uh, to pull out and the entire event could actually implode. It's kind of a Nokia phenomenon, if you see what I mean. Yes, I said a pivotal edition and we'll be in the very middle for, of all this to grasp the feeling of the moment, super interesting for us and we'll give you our thoughts, obviously. But let's now talk about a very different subject and I have to admit that I was almost shocked not to have heard before about this incredible 10,000 year clock project back, uh, backed by Amazon's CEO and owner Jeff Bezos. There has been a bit of uh, further unveiling about the, the project with a video showing the first part of the assembly of this gigantic 60 meter tall clock mechanism. Yeah, you heard me right, that's 60 meter for the mechanism. And one of the purpose of the clock, uh, as its name uh, indicates, is to, to be running for the next 10,000 years and this without any human intervention. It is a massive pendulum clock and it uses a system uh, kind of similar to the one we know in the Atmos clock by uh, Gégère Lecoultre where the air pressure differences caused by heat variation 
station is used to fuel up this uh, mind-blowing machine that only gives you time upon request. And the way it will display you this is no three-hander of course, but will take into account astronomical indication. Something pretty crazy since uh, it's a, through a clever developed system taking, a in, taking into account the sun's position that these clocks will keep a precise track of time. So I'm telling you this is quite something out of this world and uh, it doesn't really stop there as you have it, like a 10 bell chiming mechanism that will ring once a day but never the same tune and this thanks to some kind of totally crazy mechanical computer that just looks insane. Anyhow what we see today is something already quite advanced in terms of the, its development stage and the project, uh, the, the genesis of the project dates back to 1989. So since the first idea and the creation of a very interesting foundation called the Long Now Foundation, uh, there has been uh, thousands and thousands of man hours spent on this project of another scale. Not mentioning of course a bit of money involved because the technology, the testing, prototyping, the manufacturing, the assembly, the creation of a kind of a habitat that could house such a clock, meaning I mean they're basically emptying a mountain in West Texas. Well all this uh, just represents incredible amounts of efforts and resources uh, and the thing I, uh, that I love the most about this project is its uh, kind of philosophical dimension and what this Long Now Foundation wants to, to put forward with it. I mean it's our relation to time, the rel relativity of time, the link between our past and the future, all the things that I have to admit takes my marks when I'm talking about watchmaking. So this is a bit of a geeky project, there's a bit of geeky Silicon Valley money behind it if you see what I mean but it's an amazing project with some very pretty powerful message that are carried by it. And for me it's a bit similar to these incredible symbolic works of art such as the construction of the pyramids and other monuments that probably at the time were also seen as crazy achievements but ultimately uh, tells a lot about our humanity. Okay I know it, I may, it may sound a bit uh, grand eloquent but I really think that this project and the role of this foundation is very meaningful. So I clearly invite you to check this out further, link below in the description box and I would uh, most uh, definitely love being able to do some serious follow up on it and actually see this uh, by myself and do some serious video report about it. it would be just amazing, I mean who knows, could, could happen. I would love it to happen. Okay so let's now get our feet a bit more down on earth and also wanted to mention in terms of recent product launches that Frédéric Constant introduced a new version of its connected watch and the way they are going is a pretty interesting one. In 2015 they had already shown uh, uh, their interpretation of the connected watch in a rather conventional mechanical looking watch but this uh, watch's movement was actually a quartz one. Well now they have achieved more or less the same but uh, with a full mechanical automatic uh, movement with a pretty cool additional feature that lets the, the wearer monitor the precision of the watch via a Bluetooth interface that you can read on uh, your smartphone. So quite interesting and though it's not really my cup of tea I still think it's a pretty cool gimmick and um, fits well with this kind of priced uh, watches. So we're reaching the end, yes it's a little bit shorter this time, a bit, and just wanted to do a little follow up also on our Watches TV award ceremony mentioned at the end of last year because this is something uh, that will become real too. And we have uh, started talking about it with our patrons since I want to involve as much as possible you guys in the definition process of this award. What makes sense, how many categories, how many watches etc. So yet another little perk for our patron community which is by the way gently becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, makes us obviously very happy but we know it will take time and it's the journey that counts. Okay one final thing but uh, next week we'll have a pretty cool announcements coming your way talking watch tripping, uh, watch clubbing and stuff yes yeah, some pretty exciting things so thanks for your time thanks for watching special thanks to our patrons Buzzworld is and some other nice surprises coming your way soon Viva Watchmaking see you shortly.